Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about protection now. So the title of this one is Invincible. No evil shall befall you. Amen? Okay, so we've been talking about this. First of all, the promises of God, they are faith activated. Okay, and a major problem that we have in the church today is that there's a lack of knowledge. People lack knowledge of full salvation. They lack knowledge of protection. They lack knowledge of healing. They lack knowledge of provision. So it's just a lack of knowledge in the church is a major problem that Christians are facing. So we need to teach the full salvation. Okay, so faith, it begins by knowing what does God say on a particular subject, and then you strengthen that with testimonies, and then belief is formed. Okay, but it tells us our problem is uh, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you don't have the knowledge of God's good will, then you have nothing to base your faith on. Faith on. If you don't know Psalm 91, then you may not have anything to believe in for protection. Okay? And we've been talking about we need to renew our minds. We need to renew our minds to the Word of God. We need to renew our minds to come to believe in His promises, to believe in His good will. Okay? And in 2 Peter 1, 2-4, it really tells us multiple times the importance of knowledge. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so notice two times it says grace and peace will be multiplied to you according to what? Knowledge. So we have to know something in order for this grace and peace to be multiplied. Okay, then he goes on to say, His divine power has given, past tense, has past tense given to us all things that pertain to life, and all things that pertain to godliness. Well, this is where you have to meditate and you have to think about it. Okay, well, what has he given us? By his stripes you were healed. That's past tense. He said, has given, past tense. Okay, he, he became poor that you are made rich. Past tense he became poor, so present tense. Your needs can be met. So we have to learn what are the things that have been given to us. Okay, that's the knowledge that we have to have. What things have been given to us because of Jesus? Okay, and protection is one of those things which we're going to talk about in this session. Everything has been given to us pertaining to godliness. Okay, well, what has been given to us pertaining to godliness? Salvation, authority, baptism of the Holy Spirit, power of God, the Word of God, the promises of God, the goodwill of God. So all these things necessary for godliness they have already been given to us. Okay, and so it's we have to know what our inheritance is. We have to know what Jesus has done for us. We have to know the goodwill and the promises of God. As it says here, exceedingly great and precious promises have been given to us. We need to seek these out, and then we need to make a decision to believe them, strengthen the beliefs with testimony and putting into practice and then we will be walking in those promises. Amen? So knowledge is key. In Ephesians 6, 12 to 16, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Okay, so 
We want to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That means every time that Satan attacks, we are victorious. Every time he attacks, we are perfectly defended. Every time he attacks, we are untouched. That, that is what we have if we have a shield of faith. Amen? In order to have the shield of faith, we need to study these promises. We need to come to believe in them through study, through testimony, and putting in practice. And then we will be untouchable, unkillable, invincible, unharmable, unsickable, uncrimable, uninjurable, undefeatable, sons of God. Amen? Remember the scriptures that said, He sometimes leads you in triumph in Christ. Is that in the Bible? He sometimes leads you in triumph in Christ. Does it say that? No. He always leads you in triumph in Christ Jesus. Always. Okay? We know that we are more than conquerors through Christ. Right? It says that, we reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. We reign. Reign means you're winning. Reign, reigning means you are prevailing, you are dominating, you are winning, you are always victorious. We reign in life through Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, let's read Psalm 91, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you, to protect you in all of your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen? Okay, remember we said that you can identify a promise, a will or a shall. A will or a shall. So think about that. When you read the Bible, will... in the heart place. When you, when you see will or you see shall, pay attention, that's a promise. Every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen. Right? Okay, let's, let's go back to verse 1. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay, so there, it's telling us there are some requirements. In order to have this perfect protection, there are some requirements. What are they? We need to dwell in the secret place. Okay, so what is that? Okay, so there's a couple of aspects to it. So first, we need to be born again. Okay, when we're born again, God is in us and we're in God. Christ is in us and we're in Christ when we're born again. Okay, so that's the requirement. Secondly, is we need to abide in love. We need to abide in love, living a loving life, living a love with action life. Okay, and there's, there's scriptures that tell us that we abide in his love by living a certain way. Okay, 1 John 4, 15 to 16 says, 
Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Okay, so in order to be in the secret place, first you have to be born again. When you are born again, it says then God abides in you, and you abide in God. Amen? Okay, so Christ in you, you in Christ. Then, in order to keep that closeness, he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So we need to be living a loving life. We can't be hating our brother. We can't be living in sin. We can't be doing evil, right? Because that's not love. So we need to abide in him. We need to, you know, the, the scripture says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he's telling you, if you cleanse your hands from sin, you draw near to God. If you enter into sin, you distance yourself from God. Wash your hands from sin, draw near, get back in sin, you push them away. So God's not moving as you're drawing near or you're moving away by, by what you're doing. Right? So, so we need to not be in sin. We need to be living a loving life, love with action. If somebody needs help, you help them. If somebody is sick, you heal them. If somebody needs discipleship, you disciple them. So whatever the needs are, it's love with action, not just words. Then it says in Colossians 3.3, 3, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What are you doing? You're dwelling in the secret place. Amen? If you're born again, and you're abiding in love, you're dwelling in the secret place. And then that qualifies you for everything that's in Psalm 91. Amen? John 14, 16 to 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Amen? So when we're born again, the Holy Spirit is with us forevermore. He's abiding with us. Now, he's not leaving us, but we can, in our soul, we can distance ourselves from God through sin and through other things. He's still abiding with us, but we kind of like, it's like if you're, if you have a bad, let's just say you're married. Okay, so you're married. When the marriage is good, you, you talk to each other, you do, you're nice to each other, you sleep in the same bed, you know, when the marriage is good. Okay, when the marriage is bad, you're still married, but the husband's in one room, the wife's in the other room. When you're talking, you're screaming, you're, you're, you're arguing, bad things are happening. So you're still married, you're still together, but you're separated. Right? Okay, well, when you get born again, you'll never be separated from God. Like, you're still married to Him, but you can, the relationship can be bad. Like, because you're sinning, you're doing, you're not walking in love. So you can, you can distance yourself in the relationship. You're still married to Christ, but you're not going to get the benefits. Amen? Amen. Okay, in 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, evil spirits, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Okay, so he who dwells in the secret place, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we see our requirements here are be born again, be, be abiding in love, and then the Spirit of God dwells with you, the Spirit of God is in you, and therefore, with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God in you is greater than he who is in the world. Therefore, you will be victorious over the devil at all times. Amen? Amen. Shield of faith. Quench all the fiery darts. Not some of them. Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Okay, now Psalm 91 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Okay, so our Father, He's a place of safety, He's a place of protection from all danger, from all distress, from all calamity. 
And so when we are abiding in our Father, then we are in a place that is literally inaccessible to the enemy, untouchable, invincible, unkillable, unsickable, unharmable. And always reflect back on Jesus. Remember that Jesus, he was never once harmed until he submitted himself to be harmed. He submitted himself to be harmed so that we would get salvation, so that we would get the benefits of salvation. But read the, read the scriptures. Time and time again, they wanted to kill him. How can we destroy him? Let's throw him off the cliff. They were continuously plotting to kill Jesus, and he could not be touched. The storm could not touch him. The Pharisees could not touch him. The scribes could not touch him. The devil could not touch him. He was, un, he was invincible until he submitted himself for, the, for our salvation. He was invincible. Okay, all that invincibleness that Jesus had, it's available to us also. Okay, so our responsibility is that we need to trust in him. We need to be in faith by believing his promises of protection. You know, that means we need to do Bible study. We need testimonies. We need to confess scripture. And we need to put the word of God into practice. Okay, now, I mentioned that God can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. So the, the more we can stretch our thinking, then God can still do more than that. And something that we can do to stretch our believing is look up words. Like, you would be surprised what ordinary words in a scripture actually mean. Usually, like, Greek has a meaning that's this big, and English has one little word that's about that big. When you look at the Greek, it's a big, it's a big deal. When you look at English, it's a small deal. And so when you look at the words, same thing with Hebrew. The Hebrew word means all this. The English word means that. When you look at the original language words, then your imagination is going to be stretched. The scripture will get bigger. What God can and will do will get bigger in your life. Okay, so what is this word refuge? I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. A refuge is a shelter or protection from danger or distress. A, shelter, uh, a refuge protects from danger, distress, and calamity. A refuge protects us by its strength. And then the favorite, the, the last part is my favorite. A refuge is any place inaccessible to an enemy. Inaccessible to an enemy. If we are dwelling in the secret place, if we are born again, if we are walking in love, if we are trusting in God, we are inaccessible to the enemy. We cannot be touched. Amen? Amen. That's awesome. Okay, what's a fortress? Any fortified place, a fort, a castle, a stronghold, a place of defense and security. A fortress is defense, safety, and security. Okay, so these are strong words. So our Father, abiding in our Father, abiding in Christ, we are inaccessible to the enemy. We are in a place of perfect defense. We are in a place of perfect security. Amen? Let's look at verse 3. Surely, that means without a doubt, Surely, without a doubt, he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Okay, what is shall? Shall means, this is a promise, surely, most certainly, he shall deliver you. It's a promise of God. What does that word deliver mean? Surely, he will snatch you away from the snare of the fowler. Surely, he will rescue you from the snare of the fowler. Okay, so he will he will protect you. He will snatch you away from the harm. Okay, what's a snare? Okay, a snare, it's a trap. It's a trap, it's a snare. It's one, uh, a snare is like a, a plot of a calamity against you. It's an agent of calamity. Okay, so Satan, he lays traps for us. Satan is like a fowler, he's a trapper. He's a bait layer. He tries to lure you into a trap. Okay, well, our Father says he will snatch us away. He will rescue us from a trap. 
Satan lays traps. He may, like he may send some beautiful woman to tempt a man to lure the man into a trap. Okay, he may, he can lay all kinds of traps, right? That's just one example. He may lay a trap of temptation. He may lay a trap of having somebody speak words of death, trying to entice you to believe. He may lay a trap of somebody teaching wrong doctrine to ruin your believing. So there's all these different traps. But if we trust in our Father, He shall surely rescue us from any trap that the devil lays for you. Amen? Then it says, He shall surely deliver you from the perilous pestilence. Okay, what's a perilous pestilence? That's the Hebrew word deber. Deber means a pestilence, means a fatal epidemic disease. A contagious or infectious epidemic disease that is virulent and devastating. It is something that is destructive or pernicious. It's a plague. Okay, so a perilous pestilence is like some plague, like plagues of the old days would come in and kill tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Okay, so hundreds of thousands of people are dying, but he will deliver you. Amen? He will deliver you. If you're abiding in the secret place of the Almighty, He will deliver you. So it can look extremely scary. There can be thousands of bodies around you, but it will not touch you. Amen? So point E, God will surely, absolutely, without a doubt, protect you, rescue you, deliver you, and snatch you away from every trap, every snare, every plot, he will rescue you from every trapper, from every bait layer. He will keep you safe. He will protect you from all disease. He will protect you from plagues. He will protect you from, from any and every work of death. He will protect you from any and every form of destruction. This is extreme protection. Amen? Amen. Verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Okay? So we are to seek refuge. We're to flee for protection by knowing His truth. His truth, knowing His truth, knowing His word, knowing Psalm 91, that's the truth that we need to know. We need to know that we have a promise of perfect protection. We need to know that preservation, salvation, it's part of our salvation. It's part of what belongs to us in Christ. We need to know, his, the truth we need to know is His promise of protection, and then that becomes a shield. Truth, truth of His promises becomes a shield to all the attacks of the enemy. So if we can take to heart and come to believe Psalm 91, then we can truly be invincible. Now I want to compare... Psalm 91, verse 4, with Ephesians 6.16. So Ephesians 6.16 says, Above all, okay, the most important thing is taking a shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Okay? Taking a shield. So notice Psalm, verse 4, talks about, And under his wings you shall take refuge, his truth shall be your shield and buckler. So if we have truth, we will have a shield. Okay? Amen. Truth in Psalm verse 4 is the same thing as faith in Ephesians 6.16. Your faith comes from knowing the truth. The truth is that He will rescue you. He will snatch you away from the trap. He will deliver you from the perilous pestilence. You will abide in a fort, in a fortress. Amen. So there's these truths in Psalm 91. These truths result in faith. If we have the truth, we have faith. And then what do we have? We have a shield that protects us from the enemy. Amen? Okay, so let's look at verses 5 to 8. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 
and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Okay, so if we love God and trust in Him, then we can live free from all fear. In fact, we should be free from all fear. We are not to be afraid of terror coming upon us. We are not to fear the murderer or a rapist or someone stalking at night. We are not to be afraid of the burglar or the home invader. We are not to be afraid of war or rioting or violence of any kind. We are not to be afraid of any disease. We are not to fear anything that brings death and destruction. He says, you shall not be afraid. We shall not be afraid of any terror. So no matter what is going on around you, we should not be afraid. He promises perfect protection. I mean, imagine verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. So your protection is so perfect. There's a thousand people dead right here. There's heaps and heaps of bodies. There's... 10,000 bodies on my right hand, heaps and heaps and heaps of bodies. Like, can you imagine? Heaps, 11,000 dead bodies, and you're standing. Amen? Amen. That is perfect protection. We should, be, we should be fearless. We need to believe in this. We need to confess this. Daddy, I thank you that in the name of Jesus, I am perfectly protection, protected. I thank you that in the name of Jesus, no plague shall come near my dwelling. No evil shall befall me. Nothing shall by any means harm me. I declare in the name of Jesus, you are my refuge. You are my place of safety. I am inaccessible to the enemy. I cannot be touched. I cannot be harmed. I am perfectly protected. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You have included this in my salvation. Thank you. And amen. Amen? amen. Think about... Think about King David. He did some crazy things. Like you know that Saul wanted to kill him, right? And he was trying to prove to Saul that he wasn't he wasn't trying to harm him. Saul thought David wanted to kill him, and David didn't want to. And so David decided to do something crazy. Like Saul and all his people are down there. You know, David's hiding in a in a cave. And then he goes down there in the middle of the night and he brought his buddy with him, took a pair of scissors, and he went up and cut while Saul's sleeping with all of his people, he walks into the enemy's camp and cuts a piece of his garment and takes it back to him. And then what did he do? When Saul, when Saul found him, he's like, look, I could have killed you. I don't want to kill you. I could have. I went and cut a piece of your garment. So I was present and you were asleep. I could have killed you. But I didn't. And so he made peace in that moment. Because Saul realized he could have killed him. But, but what I want to point out is that David was bold in the protection of God. That's what I want to point out. He was bold. I'm going to walk straight up into the middle of, my, of this person who wants to kill me. I'm going to go in the middle of his camp. All his people want me dead, and I'm going to do this thing. That is somebody who trusts in God for protection. Amen? Okay, so let it be the same way for us. So in the same way that he went into these physical enemies' camp, we can do the same thing. You can, you can go into a medical enemy camp. You can walk into the hospital with diseases everywhere and touch the people and heal them. If a plague breaks out, people are dropping dead, you know, and they're telling you to evacuate or be quarantined. Now, you can touch those people. You can heal them. It's not going to touch you. Amen? But be believing this. Be confessing it. Be believing it. Be hearing testimonies. So again, you want to meditate on what the scripture says. When it says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Well, start thinking about what are some things that people are afraid of. They're afraid of robbers and rapists. They're afraid of a murderer. They're afraid of the prisoner who escaped. You know, they're afraid of, uh, of some a Taliban, a, a crazy person of another religion coming to do something. So think about the different things that might be terrors and then come to recognize that you are, you are saved from that. You are protected from that. But engage your imagination to fill in the blanks, to get a better understanding of what you are protected from. A terror by night. 
There's no reason to be afraid of a murderer. He's not going to get you. An arrow that flies by day. What does that mean? That you should not be afraid if there's warfare. A pestilence walking in darkness. A pestilence is a disease. Don't be afraid of disease. A destruction that lays waste. That could be anything that destroys. It could be warfare. It could be disease. It could be riot. It could be accident. It could be plane crash. It will not happen to you. Amen? So think of examples. Stretch your imagination on what this protection actually means and confess it. And it will come true. Okay, if we look at verse 9 and 10. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Okay? So I want to look up some words. So first of all, it says, no evil shall befall you. What does that mean? The word befall is the Hebrew word anah. Anah. Anah means to meet, encounter, approach, be opportune, to allow to meet. Okay, so what does that mean? So no evil shall meet up with you. No evil shall encounter you. No evil shall approach you. No evil shall be allowed to meet you. You see that? So that means the evil will not even touch you. It will not touch you. No evil shall befall you. It's, that means it's not going to encounter you. You will be untouched. The evil will not touch you. It's not like you get touched and then you need healing. It won't touch you. It stops right there. Amen? It can't get past that. You are protected. Okay, so no evil will, it will, no evil will encounter you. It will not come upon you. It will not approach to you. It cannot meet up with your body. It cannot. Amen? That's what that word means. It doesn't mean evil will hit you and then you get a miracle to get saved from it. It means it won't touch you. So we want to set our faith on the highest thing. The highest thing is not healing. The highest thing is being preserved from all harm. If you're preserved from all harm, you will never need healing. Amen? Healing means something bad happened to you. Okay? There's greater good than healing. The greater good is don't be touched by the enemy. Amen? That's what we want. We want to use healing to help people around us. We don't want to need healing. We want to be preserved. That's part of our salvation. Psalm 91 is our physical salvation. The entire psalm is physical salvation. All of this belongs to us. Okay? It says, no evil shall befall you. What is that word evil? It's the Hebrew word ra. Okay, what does ra mean? Ra means evil, distress. No distress shall, no distress shall come upon you. No misery shall come upon you. No injury shall come upon you. No calamity shall draw near to you. No adversity shall come upon you. No wrong or evil shall come upon you. No displeasure or grief or harm or hurt or mischief or misery or sorrow or trouble or wickedness or wretchedness. So if you look at that Hebrew word, it means all that stuff. So be confessing this. Daddy, I thank you that no evil will befall me. No evil will encounter me. No distress will come upon me. No injury will come upon me. No calamity will happen in my life. No adversity will come upon me. You know, so be confessing these things. Be believing these things. When you look up that word raw, it means it's bigger. There's much more that you're saved from. Amen? Okay, and then it says, Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Okay? What is a plague? It's a stroke, a plague, a disease, a mark, a plague spot, a the infliction of a blow, sore, stricken, strike, wound. Okay, so it's some, it could be a disease or some blow of the enemy coming against you. No blow of the enemy shall come near your dwelling. That means you're, you're, you and your dwelling are safe and sound. All the neighbors got hurt, but nothing happened on your property. That's your dwelling place. You dwell on your property. You dwell in your house. You dwell in your body. 
Okay, so I confess all those. I dwell in my car. I dwell in my workplace. Wherever I am, I'm dwelling. No plague, no evil, no sickness shall come upon me. No calamity shall come upon me. It cannot touch me. Amen? And I want to read another version. This is the concordant literal version. It says, evil shall not be your fate. And contagion, it shall not approach your tent. Perfect protection. Evil shall not be your fate. Evil will not come upon you. Calamity and disaster, injury and accident, sickness and disease, it shall not come upon you, nor you, nor you, nor any of us here. So be it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Okay, let's look up the word keep. The angels will keep you in all your ways. That's Hebrew, shamar. Okay, shamar means to hedge about as with thorns. It means to guard, to protect, to attend to, beware, be circumspect, take heed. Let me fast forward. To preserve, the angels will preserve you in all of your in all of your ways. The angels will save you in all of your ways. The angels will guard you in all of your ways. Okay, but think about this word to hedge, to hedge about as with thorns. So there's like a a hedge of protection around you, and it's thorny. It has spikes. So when the enemy tries to come near, he tries to draw near, it's like he's hitting spikes. It's, it hurts. It hurts him. He gets hurt trying to come get you. It's a spiny, thorny hedge of protection. So when the devil tries to come get you, he's going to run into this hedge of protection that these angels will do for us. Amen? They will protect you in all of your ways. They will hedge about you as with thorny shields and protect you in all of your ways so that the evil cannot come upon you. Okay? Remember, everything is voice activated. Be speaking the scripture over your life. The angels hearken to the word of God. Right? That's what the Bible says. The angels hearken to the word of God. They hear it, they hear the word of God spoken, and then they do it. So we need to be speaking it so that they're doing it. Be speaking it, they're doing it. Amen? Be speaking it. So the idea of having a guardian angel, it is true. Our Father puts angels in charge of us, and they have the responsibility to protect us from all harm at all times in all that we do. Okay, because it said to keep you in some of your ways. No, keep you in all of your ways. Okay, so they not only protect us from blatant evil, but things that we call accidents. Like it says, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. What's dashing your foot against? You accidentally kicked a stone and hurt your foot. That's an accident. You, will even, you even have protection from what we call accidents. So you're not only protected from blatant evil like disease and robbers and murders, but you're protected from accidents also. So literally, I know that I know that I know the car will not crash and I will not be harmed. The plane will not crash and I will not be harmed. The stones will not fall off the mountain and land on my head or, or I will not be harmed. I will not get hit by a car walking down the street. I will not fall off a motorcycle and get hurt uh, if something happens. I will not be harmed. I am protected from blatant evil. I am protected from accidents. I am protected from all evil. Amen? Okay, Psalm 91, 13. It says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Okay, we've been talking about authority, so this is familiar. And we compare it with Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God, 
resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, so most of the world, they're afraid of everything. Even the Christians, they're afraid of sickness. They're afraid of accidents. They're, they're afraid of plane crashing. They're afraid of what's going to happen in rush hour traffic. They're afraid of this. They're afraid of that. They're afraid of the robber. Afraid of the criminal. Afraid of the burglar. They're afraid of everything. Okay, don't be afraid of anything. We, we have authority over the devil. We resist him, he will flee. We have all this perfect protection outlined in Psalm 91. Don't be afraid. The table is turned. Before you were born again, Satan was your God. After you're born again, he has no authority over you. And through Jesus, our sins are washed away, and Satan has nothing in us. It's sin that gave the devil authority over mankind. Sin. And Jesus, when he washes away the sin, Satan has nothing in you. Remember, Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming for me, but he has nothing in me. Because Jesus had no sin. So Satan had no authority over him. But Satan had authority over every other person who ever committed sin. He had authority over them because he had something in them. He had sin in them. They had bowed the knee to him. But when that's washed away by the blood of Jesus, we are redeemed out of the authority of darkness, and we are in Christ. Now we tell the devil what he can and can't do. We run him over. Amen? We have perfect protection. He's looking for a fortress and refuge if he comes around us. Amen? The table is turned. We are in charge. Okay, let's look at verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Okay, so we have will, will in here. So we have promises of God. Because he has set his love upon me. And that's a requirement on our part. If we are born again, then surely we love God, right? Okay, so we, we need to be born again. We need to love God. And then we're qualified for this. I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Okay, that word that says, because he has set his love upon me, that's the word chashak. Chashak means to love, to be attached to, to long for, to cling to, to have a delight for. Okay, so we are attached to Christ. We are attached to our Father. We long for Christ. We long for our Father. We cling to Jesus. We have delight in Father. We have delight in Son. We have delight in Holy Spirit. Amen? So that's the kind of love that we have, right? And then he says, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. So deliver means I will rescue you. Evil shall not come upon you. I will rescue you. Before the evil touches you, I will move you out of the way. Before the evil comes upon you, I will rescue you. Before the disease touches you, I will shield you. And so he's delivering us before it touches you. You're preserved from all harm. Preservation is better than needing a miracle to recover. We don't want to need miracles. We want to give miracles. We don't want to need miracles. We are preserved from harm. Let the miracles be for the people we help. But we shall walk in the promises preserved. Amen. Now, it says, I will set him on high. That doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? I was not impressed with that, with that piece of scripture. What does that mean? I will set him on high. Who cares? What does that mean? So one day I said, let me, let me just look up the word and see what it really means. And the word set on high is sagab. Sagab means to, to be high. To be in excessively high. To be too high for capture. To be safely set on high. To set securely on high. So when it says, I will set him on high, it means he has put you in a place where the devil's jumping up to get you and he can't touch you. You are, you are out of touch of the enemy. You are preserved from all harm. No evil can draw near to you. No evil will come upon you. No plague shall come near you. Amen? He can't touch you. You are seated on high in a place that Satan cannot get to. That is perfect protection. That is preservation protection. Preservation from all harm. 
You don't need miracles. Be preserved. You won't need a miracle. We don't want miracles. Going, living life from miracle to miracle is scary. It's miserable. Because that means you always have a problem and you always need to be saved. Just stay saved. Stay preserved. Amen? Okay, I want to read it from Concordant Literal Version. Because he is attached to me, I shall deliver him. I shall make him impregnable, for he knows my name. That means untouchable, invincible, unkillable, unharmable, unstoppable, undefeatable, unsickable, unaccidentable, unshootable, unbeatable, unrobable, just impregnable. You cannot be touched. Amen? Verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Will, will, and will. Okay? He says, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. That means all of our prayers are answered. You call on him, he will answer. It's not maybe. He will answer. We have other testimonies to that. Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Will, 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 and will. John 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen? John 16. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Okay? Amen. So we have four witnesses, Psalm 91, Matthew 7, John 14, John 16, ask and you will receive. All of your prayers shall be answered. So we should know the good will of our God and pray for those things and it will be done. Boom, like clockwork. Boom, 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 boom. He will answer. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say no. He didn't say come back later. He said he will answer. Call upon me and I will answer. Okay, and he will be with you in trouble, and he will deliver you and honor you. He will save you from all trouble. Amen? Amen. Okay, now maybe we have we have to we have to grow in the things of God, right? So even though I like teach healing and I haven't been to a doctor since sometime before May of 2013. Satan put some stuff on me, and I had to fight it off. Okay, so I wasn't perfectly preserved. But we're working to that perfect promise. Okay, so don't be discouraged. Set your, set your sight on preservation. Go for it. Confess it. Believe it, right? If stuff happens, don't, you know, just defeat it, right? We're, we all grow. We're, we're going to experience these promises. Hopefully we experience them 100%. But... We grow in everything we do in life, right? So you grow in faith. You grow in walking untouchable. We grow in these things. All right, so don't be dismayed. Let's just say something happens. Like I had some, I had two coworkers. They were believers in Jesus. They weren't strong in, they weren't strong in every aspect of salvation. And both of them, Satan stole their job. Um, both of them, they got, they got laid off. A lady, she got laid off from work. Um, she got fired. You know, we don't, we don't need you anymore. We moved your job to Mexico. You know, we don't need you anymore. So they let her go. And so we prayed in agreement for her. You know, in the name of Jesus, Satan, I command you, remove your hand from her finances. Remove your hand from her employment situation. In the name of Jesus, every financial obligation be fulfilled. Every bill be paid. In the name of Jesus, good and godly job come forth in Jesus' name. Okay, you know what happened? The same company hired her back a few weeks later with a promotion and a pay increase. Boom. What happened? 
And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So what happened? So she wasn't strong enough she, she wasn't strong enough to be perfectly protected from harm. She got let go. She had a financial impact. But God turned that thing around. So people prayed in faith for her, helped her, and God promoted her. He gave her a promotion and a pay increase after the company had fired her. The same company hired her back with more money and a bigger job. Amen? So Daddy, he, he lifted her up. She suffered a blow. But he lifted her up beyond, above that. Amen? And the same thing happened to my friend Lottie, Lottie Omadiki from the Congo. Okay, he's, he's my friend that I work with. He just all of a sudden, that his boss said, we got to let you go. Like, no reason whatsoever. They just fired him. What happened? The devil came in. He stole his job. Just out of nowhere for no reason said, we don't need you anymore. Go home. It's like, what happened? You know, usually you might have an idea Something's happening. So we pray for him. Same, same prayer. In the name of Jesus, Satan, get off of his finances. In the name of Jesus, remove your hand from his employment. And in the name of Jesus, good and godly job come forth in Jesus' name. Simple, right? That's all you need. Just speak to it. Tell it what to do. And then that same week, the, the, the manager that fired him, all of a sudden he's like, oh my God, what did I do? And he went and started talking to human resources. They got a job requisition created. They hired him back with the promotion a week later. With the promotion. Like, the guy didn't even know what he did. Like, why did I fire him? It's because the devil came in, just did something crazy. People do crazy things when the devil comes upon them. And he didn't even know why he fired him. And he got the man hired back with a promotion. Thank you, guys. Amen? So if someone suffers a blow, let us keep growing. Let's keep getting stronger in the promises. And then we're also going to see this happen like these two people. They, were, they suffered a blow, but then Daddy lifted them up. He said, I will deliver him and honor him. He delivered these two people. Okay, they, they did suffer a blow. Nonetheless, he delivered them and lifted them higher. Amen? So I, I like that. Okay, but I say... In the name of Jesus, we are the ones, we shall walk in perfect protection. We shall walk in perfect preservation from all harm. We shall walk, walk in perfect preservation from all evil, preserved from all disease, preserved from all accidents, preserved from evil of any and every kind. So be it for every one of us in the name of Jesus. And I declare in the name of Jesus, every one of us, we minister the word. We teach, we disciple, and I say, we will invoke faith in the people who listen to our teaching. Every one of us. We will arise our people in faith. We will arise our people in the promises of God and ourselves and our people whom God has given us to work with. We will all be raised up, walking in the fullness of salvation and giving salvation and healing and help away to all the people around us. So be it in the name of Jesus. Okay, verse 16. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, so our Father, he promises to give those who love him and trust him long, satisfying life. Not long, miserable life. Not long, I'm barely getting by in life. life. No, long, satisfying life. Okay, if you're sick, you're not satisfied. If you're poor, you're not satisfied. If you're needy, you are not satisfied. If your family is being abused and ripped apart by the devil, you're not satisfied. You're miserable. He didn't say, with long, miserable life, I will give you. No. With long life, I will satisfy you. So it's good life. Our Father's will is that we have a long and good life. Amen? Okay, so if he promises you, he, okay, this is a promise. With long life, I will. That's a promise. I will satisfy him. So just forget about anything happening to you. You have a promise to live a long life. Nothing's going to kill you. I'm not old yet. I haven't lived a long life yet. Neither have you. We can go up to 120. That's what we're entitled to. 120 years, if you want it. Amen? So when you're satisfied... 
talk to your daddy, say, Daddy, I'm satisfied, I want to go home. But we're nowhere close to that. Amen? All right. So, do not be afraid of premature death. Do not be afraid of sickness killing you. Do not be afraid of accidents killing you. Do not be afraid of tragedies, of warfare, of murderers, because with long life you will be satisfied. The plane will not crash, because how can you live a long life if the plane crashes? You have a promise, so you have nothing to be afraid about. Nothing. Okay, and then he says, I will show you my salvation. That's that word Yeshua we've looked at. That's That word Yeshua is also a name of Jesus. His name in Hebrew is Yeshua. I will say, this is a variation of the same word. This is salvation. Salvation, deliverance, welfare, prosperity, victory, aid of God, help of God, help, saving help. We call that healing. So all of those things are part of your salvation. Everything in Psalm 91 is physical salvation. Amen? We are entitled to physical salvation and spiritual salvation. Amen? It's both. It's not just you get to go to heaven when you die. It's, it's everything you need today and forevermore. That's the salvation we have. And I like this word welfare. What does welfare mean? With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my welfare. What does welfare mean? Welfare means exemption from misfortune. It means exemption from sickness, exemption from calamity, exemption from evil. That's what welfare means. Welfare also means the enjoyment of health, the enjoyment of the common blessings of life. Welfare means prosperity and happiness. All of that is your salvation. Every bit of this is belongs to you as part of what Jesus has provided for you. So be believing it, be confessing it, be teaching it, and be experiencing it. Amen? Amen. All right, and let's look at 2 Corinthians 6.2. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Okay, in the Old Testament, they were, they were longing for the day of salvation. They were wishing for the day of salvation. Ever since Jesus came, today is the day of salvation. Amen? The minute you can believe in Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now, right now. That means right now. Now is the day of salvation. Well, what does that mean? Now is the day of deliverance. If you're in a problem, now is the time of deliverance. If you're in a problem, now is the time of welfare in life. Now is the time of prosperity in life. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of victory. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of the aid and the help, the assistance of God in your life. Now is the day of health and healing. It's today is the day of salvation. So it's not come back later, it's today. Amen? Jesus never told somebody, I'll help you next week. He never said that. He healed them now. He helped them now. He delivered them now. He fed them now. Whatever they needed, he did it now. And what does it say in Proverbs chapter 3? It says, if your neighbor asks you for something and you have it to give, don't tell him, come back tomorrow when you have it with you to give today. Is God a hypocrite? God is not a hypocrite. He cannot tell you, don't withhold from your neighbor, yet he say, I'll heal you next week. He can't do that. He'd be a hypocrite. Come back next week, I'll heal you. No. Jesus, you have the power now. Heal me now. Amen? So, so in the same way, God tells us, do not delay helping your neighbor in the same way he does not delay in helping us. Some things take some time to materialize, right? Like it may take some time for some money to come forward, a job to come forward. It may take a little while. Sometimes some things may take a little longer, but he's not going to withhold something from you. He's not going to withhold an aspect of salvation which he suffered for. He will not withhold that which he suffered from you. He wants you to have it now. Amen? Jesus was instantly resolving people's problems. 
He did not want them abiding in oppression. Amen? Okay, here's some homework. So number one, take in testimonies continually by reading testimony books, watching testimony videos, and sharing stories with one another. Faith will arise quickly. Like, we've got lots of testimonies, just people telling stories in here. Every time we gather, we should tell testimonies. Because we get strengthened. Amen? Number two, confess scripture daily that we've covered today and take various aspects of the definitions and plug them into the verse and repeat. When you confess scripture, you learn, you take it to heart, and when you believe it and when you speak it, it will come true. And number three, put word study into practice. And when you do word study of Hebrew and Greek, then it's going to greatly increase your, your understanding. Your idea of what God can do gets stretched. Remember, he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above, beyond what you ask or think. So we want to get as much of it as possible, stretch your believing as much as possible, and word study will help. Okay, number four. Think about what are the requirements for us to be protected by God. Make sure that we're adhering to those requirements. Number five. Write a letter. Describe the complete protection of God that we have learned in Psalm 91. Send it to somebody. Teach it to others. You know, take what you learn. Like you get much stronger in your beliefs when you teach it. Because you have to digest it. You have to digest it. You have to understand it. And then convey it in your own words. So when you teach something, then you, you, you more deeply lay hold of it. So it's good to teach. Number six. What were the new things you learned today? What did you learn from the word studies? What incremental understanding did you learn about protection, about salvation? So what, what incremental thing did you get today and share that with somebody? Okay, because I know we all have been believing in Psalm 91 to a degree, but when I made this teaching, I grew in making the teaching. Every time we do this, we grow. Okay, some of the things I use for word study, there's a free Bible, Bible software, it's called eSword, and you can see the link there, www.esword.net, and they have things like Bibles, they have Bibles with little reference numbers to the original Greek and Hebrew, so you can see the word plague, H6, whatever the H5061, you can look up H5061 in the Strong Dictionary. It'll tell you what it means in Hebrew, what the Hebrew means. You can look in Brown Driver Briggs Dictionary. That's for Hebrew. Thayer's Dictionary. That's for Greek. So these are some things you can use to help you do word study. Okay, there's also a website called Legion at uchicago.edu. And when you want to study ancient Greek words, like in the New Testament, you can go there and you can, and you can study. Okay, these things were extremely helpful for me. All right, now I want to tell you a testimony. So Pastor Rogers in Uganda, he has a church called Back to Jesus Church. And he had just finished studying about Psalm 91. And it was right before, it was in, um, I see that would have been April of last year, April 5th of 2018, as he was riding on a motorcycle taxi. He was on the back of the motorcycle. A car was coming in their direction. The headlights blinded the motorcycle driver, and he ended up, he, he went off into a ditch. You see that concrete pit? That's a five-foot deep concrete pit. You see him digging the motorcycle out? Okay, they're driving. The motorcycle goes into a five-foot deep, a five-foot deep concrete pit. What, what, what happened to Pastor Rogers? He flew off the motorcycle, he landed on his feet, his clothes were not even dirty. He just flew up in the air and hanging on seat. Boom. No pain, no scratch, no dirt on his clothes. The driver went to the pit. Pastor Rogers flew off the bike, landed on his feet, and did not get dirty. That's Psalm 91 right there. No evil came upon him. He was perfectly preserved from harm. The poor man who was driving didn't have that faith. He didn't have that belief. He, he got... He was a little hurt, not bad. He was okay. But he got banged up, and he went in the pit, and he got dirty. Pastor Rogers, the angels buried him up in his hands, 
Angel set him back down on the ground, untouched. Do you see the picture? How do you how do you drive off into a pit and fly in the air and land on your feet? How do you do that? By God. Amen. So the scripture is true. If we will believe it, he had just studied Psalm 91, and then boom, this happened. And Satan was trying to kill him because he had a crusade coming up two weeks later. The devil was trying to kill him with this accident because Pastor Rogers had a crusade coming. He did not want that to happen. But the devil could not touch him because it is true. Because Pastor Rogers made the Lord his refuge, even the Most High, Pastor Rogers' dwelling place, no evil came upon Pastor Rogers. No plague came upon Pastor Rogers. For fathers, angels were in charge of Pastor Rogers, and daddy's angels protected Pastor Rogers in all of his ways. And in the hands of our father's angels, they bared up Pastor Rogers, and they set him on the ground, lest he dash his foot against a concrete pit. Amen? That's awesome. Thank you, Daddy, for saving Pastor Rogers. And thank you that same perfect protection belongs to every single one of us. Thank you and amen.